welcome you to this morning's session. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the sacred land on which we stand has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. The territory was subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations. Today, Toronto is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island um, and across the world, and we are grateful and privileged to meet and work on this territory. I won't, yes, please, someone was applauding. You should, absolutely. I'd like to remind you that there is no uh, recording of video or photographs in the studio during the session. We have someone taking photographs right now. Uh, and we're also live streaming this conversation, so you can go back to it later if you'd like to. Hello to everyone who is joining us on the internet. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please share, comment, let us know where you're watching from. We thank you for joining us. If you want to keep the conversation going, we would love that. You can use the hashtag TIFF18 to do that. I'm sure there's going to be lots to share and discuss, so we would love that. This morning's session in Living Color is part of the Foundations program, which is in its sophomore year here at the conference. And uh, I'm thrilled to be closing out that program with this session this morning. Um, you're in for a real treat, this intimate conversation between award-winning filmmaking team Jennifer Bagewell and Nicholas Defoncier uh, and their longtime colorist, Mark Cooper. Um, Jennifer and Nicholas of Mercury Films have collaborated on some of the most commercially successful and visually stunning documentaries in Canadian history and in worldwide history, including Watermark and Manufactured Landscapes, which was selected by TIFF as one of 150 definitive works in the Canada On Screen program, as well as the TIFF premiere Long Time Running, documenting the Tragically Hip's historic final tour. Their latest film, Anthropocene, The Human Epoch, which is part of the special pro presentations program this year at the festival, is their third collaboration with award-winning photographer Edward Vertinsky, who also collaborated on Manufactured Landscapes and Watermark. In breathtaking tableaus, their latest documentary continues their exploration of industrialization and extraction in astonishing scale and perspective. They are joined this morning by their longtime collaborator, Mark Cooper, who is a senior colorist for Technicolor Toronto, a veteran of Technicolor for more than two decades. He is widely reputed for his creativity and his ability to enhance a director's vision. Um, in addition to working on Long Time Running and Anthropocene, The Human Epoch, he's also worked on episodic titles like American Gods, Winona Earp, and Shadowhunters, to name a few. Uh, they are going to have a discussion moderated today uh, by award-winning and CSA-nominated filmmaker Shane Belcourt. His notable works include the feature film Takaranto, the Historica Canada Minute for Chani Wenjak, the CBC documentary Indictment, and the upcoming feature film Red Rover. So, it's an amazing panel of people who are going to be letting us into their creative process and their collaboration. It's a really rare treat to be able to hear directors and their colorists speak about their process and moderated by such a wonderful filmmaker. I'm truly excited and um, I can't wait. So why don't we just bring them out? I would love to welcome to the stage our guests, Shane, Jennifer, Nicholas, and Mark. Please give them a warm round of applause. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for making it out this morning, uh, today's panel. I'm excited to uh, hear from Jennifer, Nick, and Mark about uh, the process. And thank you guys for coming out and taking some time to speak to us about uh, the magic of what you do, at least one piece of it. Um, obviously a huge fan of all the things you've done, uh, as many filmmaker and doc lovers are. So thank you for all that brilliant work. Um, I thought we'd start the day with just digging into a uh, bit of math, a bit of numbers, a bit of what is color correction and sort of the, the technical idea of what it might be, just so we're all sort of starting from the same sort of groundswell of, uh, of excitement about the process. And I thought we'd first turn to uh, Mark and uh, ask you a little bit about, if I could, uh, what is color correction? How has it evolved from printing to digital? And sort of how, how do you see its role playing in cinema as it's grown in this technical way. Okay, starting from the beginning, and color correction, you know, since movies are shot over several weeks, and in our last movies, a uh, couple years, I guess, three <laughs> years maybe, 
you know, light changes, uh, things need to be matched. But more than that, there's the ability to, you know, set the mood and really, you know, give the images some weight to be able to help tell the story. And I think that's where the real power of what we do in a room, uh, you know, helps tell the story and that's what we need to be doing. Uh, the question you said, how has it evolved? Well, we used to take our negative and have to contact print it with print stock. And the timer would have these little colored slides that he'd put in between the light and the film to make it change colors. And that's as, kind of as far as we got. Then we got uh, digital color correction, which we can do things digitally in computers. But then for features, we still had to output that to a new negative on a film recorder, a big expensive film recorder, and then print that traditionally. Um, because theaters just were still print based. And now that we finally got digital projection in theaters, we can do digital acquisition, digital color correction, digital theatrical, and it's to be have more powerful tools now than we ever had before. We were talking the other day about Kubrick and the obsession with controlling everything that you can control. And I think with the, the palette of what is available now in post production to fix, to change, to manipulate, um, I think it actually would have blown his mind. <laughs> like, I don't think he would have been capable <laughs> because he was always at the limit and pushing and pushing. But now I, I just think that, that there's, there are too many variables and possibilities. Um, and especially when you get in a great environment like the Technicolor Digital Intermediate Suite, um, so much we can do now at home on our computers that we didn't used to be able to do 10 years ago in terms of the editing, in terms of even, you know, some of the effects. Um, but that's, that's one thing that, that we've never done, never, don't try this at home, uh, right? Because A, there's calibration issues, and then um, in terms of software, in terms of, of, of the tech, if it's gonna go out into the world in some kind of standardized way, you need all of that. And also, it's, it's really not for dabblers. When you have people who do it every day of their lives, it's their vocation, it's their art, it's their passion, uh, why not avail yourself of that artistry because it, it is just gonna elevate your film that much more. But at the same time, you know, now we have, you know, computers that are doing everything. Whereas, you know, with the film recorder, you don't need a giant laboratory and telecine and all this capital to be able to just do it. Mm. So I think for people starting out, you do have the ability to just do it. And that's, that's I think, you, you know, it. now, Calibration is, of course, and security a big issue, but you know, we have really come a long way just in the last 10 years, even. So when you guys are shooting, are, um, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, but you're shooting in a log, and were you guys as directors, are you viewing the log, or you have a, LUT, a lookup table image on your, your monitor so you get a sense of what it would look like ideally afterwards, and then how long is the, so I'm trying to get a sense of how much log footage are you watching before you get into seeing some stuff that Mark might do, and how long is the process that you guys are saying, this is how long color correction is. Like most people, it's like edit, 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 sound, 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 a day of color and we're in route, you know, in, in terms of like oh not God. knowing how it's, long it really takes. Like so it's I'm curious how long you, you're looking at log before you start getting into some scenes, some images emotionally that you want to see. Well, we, I mean, we make documentary films. It's a different process than, than features, I think. And in some ways it, it will sound extremely inefficient, um, but it's a deliberate thing. It's sort of a philosophical way of shooting. So we do, our films typically take any, you know, two to five years to make. This this film, Anthropocene, took four years. We put it on hold to do the hip film because of there were time sensitive uh, constraints there. But we shoot over a number of years and we do a lot of research in the beginning, like a year of research and learn about all the places we're going. It often takes us that long to get access to where we're trying to go. Um, uh, and sometimes we were denied access, but whatever, it's a long process. And then when we get into those environments, we kind of try to forget everything that we've learned and not try to dictate or influence what is gonna happen. Like it really is when you're traveling all over the world, trying to convey something true about these places, you have to enter with um, humility and, and openness to 
what might happen. So that means not controlling the light by saying we're only shooting at this time and, uh, and, and trying to roll with what is happening all the time. So that's one thing. We totally overshoot because of that, because we have no script and we're always reacting to what is going on and trying to really be there authentically. So we have huge shooting ratios, um, you know, 200 to 300 to one. Um, and then we come back and Roland Schlimm and I, certainly for the past five films, sit and watch all the footage together. And that takes two months <laughs> and uh, we or six weeks or whatever. And we look through it all and I make notes and we talk about it and we discuss the sort of ideas of, of, of these scenes. And then we start assembling and he'll do a first assembly on his own and then we'll look at it together and slowly it gets sort of whittled down, but to you, the, the short answer to your question is, it's, it's a year-long process of editing, some 10 months to a year. And so I am looking in the edit room at log footage for a long time <laughs> before we get to Mark. And, and sometimes when we get into that, just the possibilities of what happened, it's so, um, it feels like it's way too much in the beginning. Like, oh my God, it, this is technical. It, Technicolor. This is this is like the Wizard of Oz. Like it's like going from black and white to color. And on the other hand, it forces you to go back and remember what it was like being there and and what it was really like. And 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 that's an interesting process. Your fidelity has to be to uh, the memory of what it was like. Hmm. In that. Process. Yeah. When when we're on location, I, I always try and spot through and just technically check. We, there's no time to look at rushes. Right. <clears throat> there's no onset color correction. There's no nothing. So I'm really just looking technically. And to Jen's point about, uh, you know, trying to be um, very available in documentary to what's going on around you, you don't want the machinations of production to get in the way. You're not going to stop. Okay, wait, let me just check and make sure I got that. And, and yeah. let me drop a LUT on this to... A, a LUT being a, a way of looking at footage that... The, the cameras, we always shoot log, just to, I don't know what level of kind of Does um, everybody know what technical log means? Uh, experience well, that there is in the room. So uh, because, because our, our films, um, especially more recently, put so much emphasis on the visual, um, we shoot in a way that uh, basically the original file in the camera has all the available color and uh, visual information um, recorded in a way that we can manipulate it later in the edit suite and in, in, in the color suite. But when you look at that raw file or that, that, uh, th that file, it looks like crap just in and of itself because you so haven't flat. added all those things. There's no baked in looks that you're committing to there. Um, uh, so no, we get no, there's no pleasure. And even in editing, we'll <laughs> fix it up a bit so it's not distracting, but, but Jen's right. It's when, when you get it into the color suite, it's almost like you've been you've been rehearsing the play, uh, you know, without costumes, and then you get your dress rehearsal where you get all the costumes, and it goes Technicolor, literally. Um, uh, so uh, other people are way more about, oh, we know it's going to look like this, so we're shooting it for that. Um, there isn't time for that the way we work. There's no, I don't even have a camera assistant, you know, usually. I've tried to have a camera assistant a few times, but... They're, they're all so good, I just say, okay, well, you go shoot that, because, you know, because uh, that's a more efficient use of time. You know, mm. Don't be helping me. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really not until the end that we're, that we're thinking and looking about uh, color options. And when you are thinking about looking at color options at that stage, um, is it, how much is it just like, let me just throw an S-curve on there. Let's just get a basic l grade on the thing. Or is it, do you, in the sense of just give me some contrast, give me something that looks nice. Or is it, or technically fix some overexposure elements. Or is it right away you're like, no, this act has this kind of mood. And no, it has these, sh these scenes in it. We're looking for this kind of emotional quality to the sequence. And then it, how much pre-notes are you supplying to Mark before he begins his process? Um, depends on the project and the schedule. Um, so we'll often talk beforehand. Often we've brought in tests too when we're editing to say, okay, this might be offside, didn't hit the exposure, or there was some there's something that we're worried about. Can we technically use this shot? So I would say, in the practical sense, you've already seen a few things, and we will have talked a bit, but really very broadly. So you usually take a first pass just to get everything 
kind of usable. Certainly this, this movie was a little different than most because there was the VR component and the gallery installations, and Ed Bertinsky sent a box of photographs that say, I want it to look like this. That's and that all, that was all, you know, piled in to make, you know, all the elements come. And yeah, we, we spent two days pre-grading, and then Nick comes in and we do, um, start building the looks, and that's when we start talking about the emotive part of it, like what we want to do. And then, um, just like most features, and the director will come the second week and we'll start working about tweaks. So it's very important to get the conversation going very early so that the, the DOP and the director are on the same page and that I'm on the same page as well. And, and a feature that's uh, narrative, you know, I'll get the DOP in before production is the best way and we'll talk about looks and viewing lets for him to or her to use on set while they're lighting and apply those grades in dailies. So right away, the editors, the producers, networks, if it's television, all kind of get used to the, the, the vibe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it makes it much easier in the final stage. Documentary, you were really building the story so much later that it's a much bigger puzzle, but you know, all the conversations you, you, you have to make sure. And the final tweaks go easy. Once you've got that kind of base there, you know, you, you learn to work in a way that you can just quickly, you know, change things. When If Jen says, you know what, I really wanted this to feel more somber or it's just too happy feeling. We gotta make this, yeah. you know, we gotta tweak this more a little like bit hell. different, right? It should feel more like hell. This looks too good. We're gonna have to dumb it way down. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this happens all the time, so. Mm. Yeah, because we don't we shoot with the back? script, we can't, um, we can't always predict what the mood of a scene is going to be back. until we know where, how it fits in the edit. These mm -hmm. films get written in the edit room, um, so it makes sense that we leave those decisions till the end. And yeah, so practically we take a first pass, Jen comes in, Mark also has a marriage counseling license. <laughs> um, yeah, and then and when uh, Ed comes into the, uh, to the that, that's fun. Because we, we only let Ed come in for a day because otherwise he'd stay for a month. <laughs> and uh, no, we just, but he's really good at, uh, because he's, and it, he's really good at, at getting, uh, uh, at doing the levels. We should look at that clip. Yeah, should we look at, there's yeah. a clip from Watermark that actually shows Ed in his studio color timing his photographs and then you where those photographs it, were taken. Can we show clip number one? <laughs> nice work, Mark. Oh, nice <laughs> shooting. I yeah, seen what that a, in a long time. <laughs> what, what a privilege to be able to go seamlessly from the print on Ed's wall to the actual thing and not have some jarring, you know, the, the whole point is that you're kind of evolving in what frame you're looking at and you're, you're along for the tension in that journey that's only accomplishable because we can match those. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what was really hard about that? <laughs> well, Do you? Remind me. Uh, well, I remember that we, we, I mean, I remember those initial shots. It was just, you know, Ed often really pushes the contrast in his photographs in, in, in some cases. And so they, they really feel like, wow, this is, this is alive in, in a different way. And that was a perfect seamless thing. But when we tried it in Anthropocene, when we were going from the photographs, it felt like everything was just... It, it, in the beginning, that first pass stuff you did, looking at the work, it was too much. Like it was, everything was too saturated, and it was an interesting moment because it reminded me of how um, what one of the, I, I, my favorite part of the process of, uh, I mean, uh, other than the puzzle of editing, is in in post going into sound and color and focusing on this one thing, that, having the luxury of focus instead of thinking about a million things at once, and then this one thing that makes the whole thing not just so much better, but actually it's a cohesive element, right? It comes, it comes together. But, and I notice, because I do this more in sound, Nick goes into color with Mark, I'm sitting in the sound mix, it's, it's sort of two weeks, and then we run back and forth and check. But you can get so involved in it that, that sometimes um, you go too far. And as soon as it starts to, in my opinion, draw attention to itself, beyond the context of what you're looking at, then you're failing. 
and I thought we had some moments in Anthropocene in the beginning before we then looked at it and then Ed came in and said, take out that magenta, take out that whatever. Um, it, it, you, you can get too far into that sometimes mm. where you're, you're just focusing on one thing and then you forget about the big picture. So I have to remind myself of the big picture. And that's a perfect example of the big picture um, and the detail coming together, that scene. Well, certainly when, you know, what Ed does, and it's not like it's a, he does it across the board, but if you have a, a shot that, that you, you describe as being over the top, uh, I think about a lot when we're doing color that, you know, a really strong look can be, you know, gratifying, but, you know, can you watch it for 90 minutes? Yeah. Is it, are, are, you know, the magic of movies is the viewer being immersed in the story, and if you're outside the story, as you described, then it doesn't do you any good, so. That's we should the, talk about the hip film in that respect, because that was kind of a hard one, because almost the whole film took place in a dark stadium, like almost the whole film, and can you talk about that? You struggle with that a lot. Yeah, I mean, from the cinematography point of view, it was a huge challenge. It's either sort of very bleak, um, not very flattering fluorescent light in the backstages of these big cinder block arenas and the tour. Um, <clears throat> and then the stage was lit super contrasty, often very dark, so the cameras have trouble picking it up. And if you know the story, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, I mean, on one sense, uh, a very tragic story with Gord Downey's diagnosis, and it wasn't meant to be a tragic film at all. It was meant to be an uplifting film and a celebration, which is what that, that tour was. Um, and so we had to work really hard to make the layer of color correction not bring it down in darkness, not be, not be heavy and not imply an emotion uh, especially a negative emotion, a sad emotion, that we didn't want to be the mood of the film. Um, so we were super conscious of, of that. Um, and yeah, just lots Wasn't of technical challenges. Wasn't that really challenges. challenging? I mean, it was, everything was dark. That, that's <laughs> a, yeah, that's the situation where, you know, the hardest part, the hardest kind of documentary in that you have to follow the story, and if the story is in the corner there, then that's where it is. And Certainly having lots of lights around was probably impractical and not really helping their live situation, right? No, so when, when they have their backstage moment mm -hmm. as a band before they, they sort of cross the Rubicon you and go into that world that, of performance, yeah. it's very dark. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you almost pitch black. You had a little light on the, on the uh, in, A7. It, in the end, I had to use, yeah, a little Sony A7 with a small light to get the exposure. But um, even then, for that moment, without intruding on that yeah, moment, exactly. and, and changing it again mm -hmm. through the through the fact of being there, making the doc. And Do it's it. amazing that that's even possible. Like, whereas, <laughs> yeah, you know, couldn't have shot ten that years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, it would just it no. be a big production. Do you have the clip for that? Is we could see a hip clip. Yeah. yeah, can we play clip a number two? Clip. Thanks.
That seems like that would be easy to fix. <laughs> <laughs> no Poor problem. Mark. I mean, there were so many different cameras because we had all of their stage cameras right. and everything too, a million different formats, even frame rates uh, to reconcile. That was a massive challenge for the live stuff especially. And uh, how did you deal with some of the underexposure parts where the blacks are a little noisy and you know and the things are going from that like do you go sort of go in like is it look everything's got to be super perfect or are you going in like no there's something about this that feels just we're there in that moment if it's a little on the edges well we always start with just trying to get as much out of the negative as possible and then go from there like is it too noisy i think certainly our you know our feelings were like it's it's pretty good like did we do noise reduction on anything i don't think we did did, did we? we what do any noise no. reduction? We may have you know the what? odd shot, it, it, but it wasn't. It doesn't. It doesn't take you out of the story. It's all. It's all good. Now, part of the kind of recipe on that was because um, everything is shot on the video camera. I I used a film emulation LUT on this and that to try and. Well, I think it succeeded in getting uh, more of a movie feel, and that does. You know, it 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 does give you a lot more contrast than maybe you want. So it's a lot of work. So it's a double-edged sword there, but it's mm -hmm. in the, the end product being kind of the, the, the feeling and what you know the filmmakers are trying to get. And, and you just go for it. So. Mm -hmm. But it did really give a kind of a, again, that cohesion to uh, the cohesion of a look. And we would never, we almost never take something out um, because of a, uh, a, a, qual a technical issue, like it, it, it's, a, in fact, we fight about this sometimes mm. because there'll be, you know, Nick will, will even the focus, he'll do a focus adjustment in the middle of a shot and, and then he won't like that. Um, but then we'll say, well, that was real. We have to leave it in there. So we, we mm. it, it's, I mean, it's certainly in that film. I haven't seen that. Film our, our our films like have never once passed the the technical the quality control. <laughs> you know the, the the German broadcaster makes you have a you know clean bill of health that runs through some machine and it, the machine almost blows up on our films. <laughs> and and every time <laughs> we say screw it, it's it's a, it's a creative choice. Yeah. Yes, that shot was probably underexposed, but mm. um, you need that uh, to tell the story. And so sorry, we'll fix what we can if it's something small, but otherwise. You don't need to take the film if you don't want to, and they always do, so that's great. Mm. But that was heroic. That um, that film was hard. How many cameras were there? Like, how many cameras were we dealing with? Well, there might yeah, have been like different cameras. Twenty? More? No, more than thirty in Kingston. <laughs> so th Not that's just in Kingston Probab alone. Probably ten different formats, I think. Right. Wow. Anyway. Do you want to go to the next clip? Well, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should uh, we should skip ahead to because Mark prepared a bit of before and I after or process stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, just looking at the time, should we get to should we get to that? Certainly, sure. Yeah, if you want to talk. So we can we can go right to the one that isn't numbered if we can. We're just going to talk over topic because there's no sound. But yeah. it, it, you know, Shane asked for something before and after, and I'm looking at when we're looking at Anthropocene. Trying to see. I think what we're rolling first is the finished scene from Bagger. From can can we still dim the lights and and Mark will talk. This is footage from Anthropocene. So this looks. This crazy. just a bit of a. Well, I'll tell. This is the.
still, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's incredible, because I, I remember when I, I saw the, your film when, at the uh, scene, uh, The Human Epoch, it was, you know, at first you're, you're just taking in so much emotional uh, and just information at the same time and how you feel about it, and you're really asking the viewer to participate with it. So, you know, I, I kind of walked away from the film like, geez, I don't really know what to ask about in terms of color correction, because, you know, mostly we think about color correction, at least I do, is something extreme, like, you know, traffic or uh, the Coen brothers or Brother Where Art Thou, like this kind of very big statement about color and how we can use it to really affect things, you know, in a, in a profound or a very... Uh, over the top way to some people, um, but in this way, in this even just seeing these wonderful examples that you brought, Mark, you can just sort of see these every little touch to tie a sequence together, and then oh yeah, it's not just correction or uh, there's something that's going on not to tie the sequence, but also to sort of bring us into this movement as one big piece. And I kind of wanted to ask you guys about what is how do you see color? Like when do you start thinking about like oh this is how I want this to feel, and how do you relate those ideas uh, to your colorist? Or is it, do you just, everybody speaks in technical terms, or do people start speaking in sort of ideas and what we want the audience to engage with at this moment, how to achieve that? Well, it goes back, remember we're talking about documentary and everything we said about being in these environments and trying to convey a truth about that place is also the color of that place. So to change that too much, from what it really was is kind of wrong. It's kind mm -hmm. of lying. So it, it and remember, we're like this, we were in 47 different locations for Anthropocene, 20 countries, like everywhere, all these different, totally different places at different times of the year. When we were in Norilsk, we should have talked about that because we, Norilsk is, is 320 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. It's in Siberia, it's a closed city in Russia. Um, that has the biggest colored metal mine and heavy metal smelting complex in the world. And it took us over a year to get in. And then once we did get in, we got arrested and detained. And <laughs> it was just, it was kind of a nightmare. But uh, it was the polar day. It was the middle of summer. So it was light all the time. And the only time that we could shoot without having hard light was between 2 and 5 in the morning. Sort of, so we would go to sleep, you know, at nine, wake up, and then go out and shoot where we got a little bit of softer light. And so, I guess what I'm saying is that the like you would look at Hambach and say that that's Mordor, that's the gates of hell. Like there is really be that place is 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 a scary place to be. Mm. But if we had ignored that early morning light, which was real, which was in that moment, then it would have felt like we were manipulating a bit too much. Mm. And in Norilsk, we, we went and shot at that time instead of doing anything, everything in, in hard light, which n none of us liked, especially Ed. Um, we, we would shoot where the light was the most soft, like the most possible, and then try to, you know, have fidelity to that, mm. I think, is more. The overall ideas, conceptually, um, the color feeds into that by being real, mm. I would say. Do you have a different perspective? I, I, I think that we've never um, consciously stylized or gone for a look mm. uh, like that. Um, at the same time, these documentaries are about, uh, you know, they, they put a lot of emphasis on on the visual and the oral experience, the witnessing. It's not, it's not a lot of talking heads and information. We, we really want you to get immersed in these places and feel like you've been there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the God is in the details of all of, all of these things. Um, uh, and so first we're fixing things so that they're not distracting, technically, mm. Mm. and then we're, we're massaging them as much as possible to make them feel real to make them feel like you're like you're really there and to draw you in i mean we go to places that uh, we we choose them because of their visual impact um and so we want to amplify that as as much as possible in all the stages like color grading well mm. because of their visual impact and because of their connection to the bigger idea which is you know we're we're in these places because they're the biggest they're the examples of the biggest human incursions on the earth 
I mean, certainly in Anthropocene, with a, in a number of different cases. Yeah, not, but it, not, not gratuitous visual impact, yeah, but, exactly. but once it satisfies being part of the story, then for sure one yeah. of our one of our big uh, you know qualifiers for choosing a place is somewhere that's that's really going to be interesting to be immersed in as a viewer. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're working on the the process of color correction, is it we we view things, we make all these sort of technical notes as well as emotional sequence notes, and then do you leave Mark to do his thing for a bit, and then you come by, you, you call them and say, hey, I've got some stuff to show you, or is everyone sits in the room the entire process? Well, he, we fight. <laughs> we don't fight with Mark. I have stuff but. prepared. You know, we, Nick and I have done our, our homework and our, our done our visual representation, and then when we get Ed and Jen in the room together, uh, we tweak. So it's, um, and as Jen mentioned before, you know, if I stop on a frame and leave it there too long, Ed will, you know, uh, like he does with his prints, oh, dodge that, burn that, can you mm. fix that? Because mm -hmm. he's looking at the frame, right, as opposed to the shot sometimes. And That's why he does bring, day. though, his eye, the, he, his eye, he brings like a whole other level of stuff to it, right? But it is a, it, it's a, it's a fine line we're walking because he's got his prints already made, so some things in his mind, he, he has lightened up a lot in terms of the possibilities and how different yeah. motion picture is from stills. We talked about being real, and sometimes his stills are very super real, yeah. if that's a thing. They're kind of torque. Right? And, but that's part of his gig, is the making these beautiful, huge photographs from these really, you know, crappy places sometimes, mm. right? Mm. It's, a, it's an interesting process, for sure. Um, but the getting together and talking, like the run through of the whole thing is a bit later stage, but yeah, certainly I'll, I'll try and get it in as good a shape as possible based on what we've all talked about mm -hmm. beforehand. So. It takes quite a long time to bring it up to the level where everything's usable and there's nothing distracting. And I think for me, that's the moment when you can really start to be a storyteller again and you watch it all the way through and then you'll have a, like a gut reaction to certain things and say, oh yeah, right, that doesn't, that doesn't fit the story. Sure, it, taken in isolation, that scene, what we did is, is perfectly legitimate, but actually given what's happened before or the mood or where it fits in the, in the dramaturgy of the whole film, I think we need to adjust that. So that, mm -hmm. for me, that's the moment in that kind of, in this case, it was probably a eight or 10 day process. Mm -hmm. um, but we, it's an enormous benefit with, with Ed, who was there for multiple days and added uh, tons. Um, to have the benefit of all of us being mm. the immune system, right, uh, for for the film, what's what's working and what isn't, what is part of this film and what isn't, what what what's standing out um, that needs to be kind of brought back so it doesn't draw attention to itself. That's really that's that's what it is. It's when you live with it so long, it's in your it's in your DNA. You've learned how to make this film over the months and years of doing it. Um, those decisions are not arbitrary when mm. you're saying too much contrast or too heavy or let's lighten this again. Um, they're because, you know, you're, you're living that film. It's in you and, and, and you're in it. Uh, so that's, in a way, Jen says it's her favorite part, the post, you're just focusing on that. It's true, you're, you're Herculean. You've locked the picture, uh, all of the weight of, oh, could it have been better? What if we had done that is off you and, and you can just focus on these wonderful, particular creative um, challenges and m almost always solve them. I think on, when we're doing multiple passes on the movie, it's the later stages where you're looking at it and saying, you know, how are these shots cutting together, mm -hmm. even inside the scene? And it, for me, it's looking at it to say, the, 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 the weight of the shots need to match, right? In yeah. terms of how they feel together. And it, that density, it's color. Sometimes it's sneaking in. If that shot's got a really great, you know, warm, cool, you know, look going on, but the next shot doesn't, we gotta sneak some of that in, right? Like artificially. And is that lying? Is that, you know, part of the storytelling? But sometimes it's just to get a flow, right? And it's, you know, we are, you know, we are reality, but we're, we're not. And it's, it's, uh, it's the creative part of it, so.
And that, that's okay. That, that's mm. part of the cohesion aspect of it. But is it way harder for you? Like, be honest. Like, do you kind of groan when we're coming in? Because, I mean, when you're doing a feature and it's, a, you know, all of these things are often sort of decide, not, not decided in advance, but at least the ideas are, and you can talk to people about it before, and you're, you're not dealing with that many locations. Do you kind of say, oh my God, they're coming again, this is gonna be really hard? You know, <laughs> not really, because getting what the filmmaker wants is, is sometimes a challenge, but it's, it's your movie, and I am the conduit to you getting that look that you need. So it's a collaboration, but it's also just the technical crutch for you to get what you want because you can't do it yourself. Right. So keeping that perspective, you know, doing it for a living is a big part of the job because you have to deliver for whatever they want. So it's not like you can get uh, precious about your ideas of what you think the film is going to be because this I've seen it for eight days and you've lived with it for four years. So I need you to be able to tell me where it should go sometimes. That's just the fact of it. What's um, just a, a bit of advice you'd give to <coughs> filmmakers who are coming into work for a, a colorist with the first time of your caliber as opposed to doing it at home with you know messing around uh, with whatever kind of plugins they have. What are the kind of things that you like to see when they come to you to say, hey, this is what I want it to look like? photographs, uh, frame grabs from films? Uh, is it mostly words? Do you want pictures? Do you want them to sort of treat their own footage to say, hey, I, I was messing around. These are the kinds of things. Like, what's some best practices to get themselves ready to collaborate with you? If it's, if it's you know, people have, haven't worked with before and I don't know their style or what they're after, it's always visual references. Um, you know, they'll do their homework on what they what they like. Sometimes they take their own stuff and they Photoshop it or do some stuff and they say, I'm thinking more like this. And other times it's, um, you know, I got this big, you know, Hollywood feature and these are some really reference frames that I like. And then we'll talk about, well, what about it that do you like? Mm. You know, because what attributes of these shots are we trying to uh, glean from to, to put in your movie? Other times you mentioned about plugins and stuff. If if it's a situation where I haven't been, you know, able to get in ahead of time, like I said, about you know doing the talk about viewing LUTs and having a real solid foundation beforehand, because it happens a lot where we where we have to do stuff. It's shot, you know, it's brought to the post place way late or whatever. There is. Um, you know, the offline of the movie, if an editor and a director have done some work on it, it's because they decided what they have there is not telling the story right. So I will definitely look at those references to get the intention. Because if you just go and do your own thing, then it, you're, not, you're not servicing the movie. Mm. Um, it's only a problem when, you know, you have references that are a completely different genre of something, you know. Um, you know, I did, there was a show we did, it was like completely shot in, in Calgary in the winter, and all the references they sent me were from Lost. <laughs> it was like, which is Hawaii, I think, right? And I, and I didn't know what to do with that, uh, but so, you know, <laughs> hopefully you get good references. I, <laughs> um, I thought maybe we'd have an opportunity for some questions yeah. from the audience. Um, there's a some microphones and uh, we can start right here in the middle if uh, a microphone is coming to you so we'll wait for that to get to you uh, here it comes the hot potato and here we hi go. my name is Rocio from Ontario Creatives and I saw yesterday do your documentary congratulations it's fabulous um, but there is one part on the almost at the end when you have a different shots of many cities. But one in particular, I was amazed because I know the place is Mexico. Uh, that place has a lot of pollution. And the city, the whole city all together, like that clear, how long took, took you to, well, first, shutting, uh, and then second, how you took the whole pollution out of there. 
That's a, it's really interesting that you picked up on that because it's something that I've been wrestling with. Um, the answer is that um, we cheated in a way because we have this partnership on, on Anthropocene with um, a satellite company called Planet. And they're the th they have the third most um, satellite cameras in space, I think after the United States and China. And they take a whole picture of the world every day, the entire Earth. It's like, it's like a, a security booth, a, like a multi-camera security booth on the whole globe. And they do these amazing things where they, um, they use their visual data with algorithms to track uh, I illegal logging. Like they can actually say to authorities in Canada or Brazil or, uh, hey, we're seeing roads going in here, you may want to go and investigate because it's probably going to be um, some kind of logging. But their cameras are so sharp from space that it looks like you're in a helicopter mm. um, because it's almost like you get that close. So usually we're used to the satellite image being that perspective from, from space. <coughs> but this is actually, it's from space, but it looks closer. And, and I've had a lot of trouble wrapping my brain around it. Those but are satellite yeah, photographs. It's, 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 it's satellite photographs. So they must, yeah. have, they must have used, you know, the one day where the high-pressure system came in and it cleaned out all the particulates yeah. and... Mexico, Mexico is part of the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. 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 So um, all, all I can guess is that they, what, their computers probably figured out a day when they took that picture of Mexico City and it, uh, for whatever climate conditions that happened, pushed a lot of the pollution out so you get a clear view. But, but then after that, but after that shoot, <coughs> you, you guys didn't make any change. You didn't enhance that. You didn't well, color we, correct. Well, we tried to get those city shots. It came, it came out of another scene. Um, Legos. Where we were in a helicopter. It came out and of Lagos, where we were in a helicopter, and we go above Lagos, and you're up in the air, and then it goes to all of these cities, because the point is being made that we, you know, our population is growing, mm -hmm. um, and that's an anthropogenic marker, and then we go to all of those shots, and they were, you, no, we, we tweaked we, them. We balanced them so that they would play nicely in a row. Um, it wasn't like there was a really brown Mexico shot and I tried to clean it up because that wasn't the intention. It was, like I said, the point was about the, the urban sprawl or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And um, we just made it, it wasn't uh, vastly different from the other satellite shots. So how they shoot them, I'm not certain, but we just make it look like it's flowing, uh, like you're watching the same movie. So. Any other questions? Just wait for the mic, please, thanks. Hi, um, this is more for Mark, but what do you feel is key to becoming a great colorist? Like whether that's the relationship you have with the DP or the director or something technical, what advice do you have for junior and up and coming colorists? Uh, I'd say um, learn as much about cinematography as you can. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time on set and, and shot my own films and learned about lighting. And if you can have that shorthand with a DOP and to know, sorry, that part of the production, like the filmmaking side, but then when you're on the other end of the chain, uh, you, can, you can talk the talk, so to speak. Um, for instance, you know, it's, it, in episodic television, it's very common to have like over the shoulder shots. So, you know, if you can, you know, you, the DOP knows that you're just gonna put a power window there and darken the near side of the camera so that he doesn't have to like flag something, you know, that's like a, you know, something that you should kind of put in your repertoire is just to be able to have that, you know, shorthand with the, with the DOP. The other thing I would say is be well read visually, you know, find, you know, when I was learning how to print and, and, and still photography, my friends and I would go rush out and buy whatever the latest episode, uh, issue of Harper's Bazaar to see what Philip Dixon was doing because it was, you know, predated Photoshop and it was like looking for cool ideas sort of thing to get, you know, your repertoire going, old movies, new movies, you know, getting, and now that, this is kind of, I guess, maybe specific to working with clients more than it is your own stuff. Um, 
Maybe your question is like how to do it yourself for your own movies or? Well, no, I, I just, I think especially for junior colorists, I wasn't sure if there was any standout lessons that you learned that might be insightful. But I think what you're talking about with the relationship with DPs is, is really curious. And if I can ask another question really quickly, mm -hmm. I was curious what, if at all, your involvement with a DP was like during production. That might be more for a narrative end because it might not be possible for documentary, but what mm -hmm. that type of involvement might look like. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, getting getting to talk to the DOP and talk about the look of the show before it even starts is, is key. Um, because we shoot digital now, it's like making the LUTs, which are the lookup tables, which is basically a color correction that they can put on the monitor out of the camera, and they can watch uh, what you know some their intention of what they want it to look like. Uh, and it might not be just one light, it might be a few lights. They might say, Mark, I need a day interior, I need a night exterior, I need X, Y, Z, and maybe a few variations of those, and in the first three days of shooting, it'll kind of settle in on something they like. That process, I think, is the biggest advantage we've had in the last 10 years in, in kind of production. And it's, when you get that, that footage, you know, raw from the camera later on, it's the greatest thing to like cut out the middleman, so to speak. You know, we used to have the telecine guy in between and his interpretation and the notes. You know, I'm sure you remember the days when people oh, yeah. would send micro cassettes. You know, you know, no one ever comes in the color suite and says, "Mark, I had lots of time and money to do everything. It's going to be a piece of cake, right?" And they're always talking about. You know, I didn't get to do this, or I got to do that. So it's listening to what they need. In terms of advice on getting started, you know, I think a lot of uh, new colorists spend a lot of time on scopes, like waveform monitor and vector scopes. And I think it's they're there as a technical tool, but you know, don't watch the scopes, watch the picture, because that's really where it's all happening. And hopefully that answers your question. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, take it off now, um, but I want to thank you guys uh, for coming in today and the audience as well, and most importantly, thank you for making your beautiful and brilliant and profound films. Oh, thanks. Thank thank you. Thanks okay. for coming, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Shane, Jennifer, Nicholas, and Mark. Um, you can see Anthropocene and the Human Epoch actually today at 1230. There's a screening at the Lightbox, so uh, if you'd like to go to that, please do. Um, Oh, <laughs> it, it, it opens on September 28th. That's right. That, yeah. At the light box. There you go. So go on the 28th because it's sold out. So you can stay here. And if you want to stay here, there's a, a conversation happening at 11 with the cast of Hold the Dark, uh, including uh, Alexander Skarsgård, Jeffrey Wright, Riley Keough, and director Jeremy Saulnier. So stay here. And then on the 28th, go to Anthropocene. Thank you all so much. <laughs>